Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Paul Brewster. I'm a senior planner with Thurston Regional Planning Council, and I'm co-presenting this morning with Tom Crawford from Thurston Climate Ad Action Team. And the title of our conference is Adaptation and Mitigation, Thurston County's Two-Pronged Approach to Climate Action. And we, we've sort of been placed in the category of advocacy, and I, I think that's appropriate, but I also want to say, I, I think to speak more broadly to what our presentation about is about, is about um, public uh, partnerships and, and policy making, the importance of regionalism, and the importance of, of community collaboration. And so as a, as a planner, generally, I'm I, working for Thurston Regional Planning Council, I'm, I'm essentially working for 22 local governments in Thurston County. Um, so I'm not specifically working for one city. However, TRPC, under the Climate Mitigation Plan, has been contracted with Thurston County and the cities of Lacey, Olympia, Tumwater. So I'm really wearing the hats of those four jurisdictions and representing them today and presenting the, the Climate Mitigation Plan. But the Climate Adaptation Plan, which I'm also going to um, present to you today, was a plan developed by Thurston Regional Planning Council. And so working for TRPC, um, I am really representing diverse interests across the community. And, and I know often working in, in the public sector, there can be a sense of frustration um, from, from community members, from citizens, that government moves too slow. And part, my, my response to that is you know, establishing public policy takes time. There's a bit of sausage making going on here. In a democracy, we want to make sure that we're hearing from as many people as possible. Also, working in the public sector, doing public process and doing community outreach comes at a cost. I earn a paycheck. My agency needs to keep the lights on. So that funding that's going into developing plans like this is, I just want to say, there's really not a lot of funding to develop the kinds of plans that we should be developing. But fear not, this, this is one step. There will be more plans to come. There will be more voices heard. And so today, I'm going to kind of give you an overview of what our communities have done with respect to adaptation and what we're about to do with mitigation planning. And at this conference, I want to thank TCAT and um, uh, the Citizens Climate Lobby for putting this conference together. This is real advocacy to have a conference like this and, and have all of these presentations in these various breakout sessions. And, and for you to come to uh, this conference shows that you care. And when you care, you do research, you read, you want to get involved. So I don't want to insult any of your intelligence today by by um, assuming that you don't understand what climate mitigation and what adaptation is. But, but just a little bit of overview. When we talk about mitigation. Can I just say Sure. Uh, so I'd also like to let you know that uh, my part of this presentation is going to be talking very much about advocacy and some of the things that Thurston Climate Action Team has been doing in the, in the arena of advocacy with local government and things that we have planned. And we actually are going to be inviting you to participate with us and help us uh, advocate with local elected officials and local governments to make sure that we have strong climate action in our communities. Thank, thank you for that, Tom. And, and the nexus here is, as a, as a planner, I would advocate that you get involved with local government and state government and federal government, that, that you get involved, that you express your voice and your concerns, that you show up to city council meetings, you show up to workshops at for planning projects. That's, that's something that I would encourage you to do is to make sure that, that your views are expressed in this planning process. And, and I'll be talking a little bit about the mitigation plan and where those opportunities are for um, community members to, to get involved and help shape the plan. So mitigation is about addressing the cause of climate change. And it, it really comes down to how can we reduce the amount of heat trapping gases that, that humans are emitting into the atmosphere. And, and there's actions that you can do, and that is reducing the, the source of those gases. And, and one of those is shifting from a petrol fuel-based energy economy to more electrification, moving away from coal. 
It also can be reducing demand, and, and that can be done either through behavior um, at the individual level, um, through organizations. Um, it, it, a big chunk of that is when um, we talk about how we move about our community with mobility and transportation. You know, single occupant vehicle driving around our community is not the most efficient way to get around. So by, by carpooling, by taking transit, by bicycling, there are ways we can reduce demand. Other opportunities and actions are enhancing heat sinks, things that, that um, can help with sequestration. So reforestation, afforestation, um, other technologies that are storing these gases. And so the objective here is, is really we're trying to um, have the ability to slow the effect of climate change so that natural ecosystems can actually naturally evolve with a changing climate. We are going to expect the climate to change, but we want to reduce that rate of change so that our natural systems and our communities have an opportunity to naturally adapt. On the other hand, adaptation is, is really our coping. It's our, it's our response to the change. Humans have been doing this for millennia. Um, we, it's, it's reacting to those forces, and, and so we are going to expect uh, change in the future. So what can we do about it? to make sure that we continue to have um, really uh, communities that are sustainable, reduce suffering, make sure that our economy is still strong, be able to um, continue to live in a way that we want to and values, continue to value the things that we think are important. And so actions for adaptation, things that we've been doing all along is hazard avoidance. Um, so we, we often hear about uh, climate change, we, we understand that climate change um, with longer, drier summers are going to result in more drought, which increases the risk for wildland fires. Um, we're going to have warmer, wetter winters, so we're going to have greater precipitation, increasing, increasing the frequency of floods. But we've, we've had floods. We've had wildland fires. Um, we've experienced landslides. We've experienced some of those atmospheric-induced hazards that um, are, are not unknown here to the Pacific Northwest. But how can we prepare for and cope when we have a greater frequency or perhaps greater severity of those incidents? So we want to reduce our vulnerability to those hazards. We want to make sure that we can continue to protect our um, fresh water sources for human consumption, um, protect our water sources for fish and wildlife habitat, um, and, and also be able to adapt our economies with local agriculture, um, marine fisheries. We know that there's going to be changes to um, the timing of, say, our hydrological cycle. So how can we adapt to those changes and take advantage of them? And so how much we need to adapt will, will really be driven by how much change is occurring in our climate. And so it all really, our role, Thurston Regional Planning Council, our real call to action in getting involved with, with climate action was born out of Sustainable Thurston. Um, that was a planning project that um, kicked off in 2010, and it, it was one of the largest community-wide public outreach efforts that I've been involved with since I've been working as a planner here in Thurston County over the last 20 or so years. And it put together several groups, everything from public health to education, transportation, the economy, public safety, I mean, you name it, we were kind of looking at it. And we were projecting for um, developing a vision for 2040. And part of our, our public outreach effort was going out to the community and asking, what do you want our community to look like in 2040? We're going to have, our population is going to grow by nearly 100,000 people. That's going to have an impact on our transportation network, on our housing, on our natural resources. So that kind of set the stage for some recommendations for how we can live more sustainably in the face of, of a growing um, population here in Thurston County. And 12 priority goals came out of that. And here's just a few that were related to the environment. And that was about protecting our, our water quality. Um, making sure that we have water supply in perpetuity to maintain our, our livelihood and way of life here in Thurston County. But as it relates here to this climate convention is 
moving towards a carbon, carbon neutral community. And the first action with that third goal was finding resources for, for developing a climate action plan. That cost money. Where does that come from? Our first opportunity was TRPC received, applied for and received a grant from um, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in 2015. Um, it was a, a watershed grant um, looking at watersheds that drain into the Puget Sound. So you see this, the lines on the map were the Nisqually and the Deschutes and the Kennedy Goldsboro watersheds that drain into the Puget Sound. And that, that was our focus area. That's where we did all of our, our science and our research. However, the actions that came out of, of that planning process are applicable to the entire Thurston County region. It's not just limited to those watersheds. Those same geography, same type of lowland forest habitat, same marine areas, um, same prairies. The adaptation actions that came out of this plan would be applicable not just to Thurston County, but the general um, South Sound region overall. However, the action who it directly affected were recommendations for um, those communities located inside that project area. So 91 actions were identified um, that identified leads, whether it would be tribes, cities, the county, special purpose districts like um, fire districts or inner city transit. Um, and actions, and like I said, those actions could be adopted and applicable to communities like Tenaino and, um, and, and further south if, if necessary. So a little bit about the adaptation plan. Um, of course, it includes goals and a vision and guiding principles that drove the plan. Um, something I, that's important to point out, I, I think this adaptation plan, which is available on TRPC's website, is probably the most definitive resource for understanding what the climate change impacts will be like here in Thurston County through that vulnerability assessment and that risk assessment. So we built off of the work that was done by the University of Washington Climate Impacts Group. We took their data, we modeled some of their um, methods to evaluate what the climate impacts would be here in Thurston County, which resulted in 91 actions and recommendations within those six themes. Um, so we're looking at issues of drought and water quality, flood and erosion, transportation and energy, and how we deal with drought and extreme heat. And that general category was kind of a catch-all. And I'll give you some examples of what those are like. So I had kind of touched already on what some of these climate impacts are going to be. But in general, wetter, warmer winters and hotter, drier summers. And I've talked about how that would manifest in, in the frequency and severity of, of natural hazards that we're already experiencing but potentially um, huge disruptions to our hydrological cycle in terms of our, our shrinking snowpack. Now here in Thurston County, much of our water is not coming from, um, our, our potable water is largely from artesian wells. It's deep groundwater sources. But we know that there's Nisqually Glacier runoff into the Nisqually River for salmon habitat. So we know that um, snowpack will be shrinking and changing the timing of stream flow volume which can affect temperature and turbidity of streams, which will impact salmon and other riparian dependent species. Um, rising sea levels um, uh, poses threats to our urban environment in downtown Olympia and those areas along the shoreline, increased erosion. Um, less water in the summers, um, which, which means that our stream flows are also gonna be decreased. And so we're gonna have competing uh, Res competing demands on our groundwater resources, both for human consumption, but also maintaining for those summer stream flows to support fish and wildlife. And so we looked at opportunities to evaluate a, a range of, of actions. And if you think about it, there's, there's a, a, a lot of relationships between uh, the risks and, and how those actions can actually mitigate those risks. And so some of the criteria we looked at was magnitude, like how many risks could a particular action address? Because sometimes an action can actually have a real positive impact on, on more than one. Um, is that action just a short-term or a long-term solution? Um, 
to what degree um, will that action actually be effective in reducing the risks? Is it already being taken care of on the side effects? You know, does that action have, have a, a negative impact on our other community goals? Um, does it have a positive impact? And then we also wanted to look at it through the, lens, the equity lens in terms of how it impacts the people across the community. So when I talk about equity, it's everything from um, someone's race, their socioeconomic status, their age, their ability, um, whether they have a physical disability or not, or, or if, if they're indigenous peoples, tribes that have traditional hunting and fishing grounds and the climate change impacts on, on their um, food sources and what do these actions mean for uh, either positive or adverse impacts on, on those communities. And so these were kind of point-based here. And so actions that had a greater number of points um, we perceived as being more effective and they became higher priorities in the planning process. So there's 25 priority actions and each of those actions um, were associated with a risk, identified who the leads are, um, the partners that could be involved with implementing those actions, and a timeline for their implementation. And so just some examples of, of the actions in the plan. There's three here. Uh, general action one was um, a call to start training local government staff and even state and federal staff on, on being able to deal and understand the effects of climate change and what that means for business as usual and how we might need to change business as usual to be able to adapt to and mitigate climate change. T1, that's trans, um, transportation and energy. So that was talking about providing utility incentives um, for energy efficiency, whether that's commercial buildings or residential. Um, action T5, this was actually pulled from the Thurston Region Hazards Mitigation Plan, and that's talking about um, evaluating our transportation infrastructure so that we have some level of redundancy in that infrastructure when we do have disruptions um, from floods and wildland fires, landslides. This slide here is really just to say this plan is real accessible. Um, it, it total, it's the, the total overall plan is about 100 pages, but it's really graphically rich, um, really written for a lay audience, real easy to process. Um, the technical information um, and some of the analysis is held in the appendices. But like I said earlier, I really want to reiterate the appendices for this climate adaptation plan in terms of the risk assessment and the vulnerability assessment. If you really want to truly understand how climate, in, climate change will impact our region, um, the appendices in this plan is the, is the source to really get immersed in that. In addition to the actual plan itself, um, we created a resilience toolkit. So on our website, there's these tabs with preparedness, planning, maps, and literacy um, that links to other resources from other organizations as well as within Thurston County. The literacy tab, um, if you were to view that, you would actually get a, a link of suggested reading in books and literature that you could check out from Timberland Regional Library related to climate change and mitigation. And then that map on the lower left, that's an online story map produced by TRPC that was done with the hazard mitigation plan that allows you to be able to basically look across the tabs of whether it's um, wildland fire or flooding or landslide risks and even earthquake to be able to see what parts of your community has vulnerable infrastructure that could be affected by those hazards and whether they're in or out of hazard areas. So now on to the mitigation plan. There were two phases. Phase one um, kicked off in 2018, and TRPC worked with um, those same four jurisdictions um, to assess each jurisdiction's climate goals, assessing what actions they've adopted and have already implemented. Um, the, the two things that were really seminal in coming out of phase one is for the first time ever, um, Lacey, Olympia, Tumwater, and Thurston County all agreed to the same emissions targets. And I'll, I'll present those here in just a second. But the other thing that came out of this is those communities have also committed funding 
a total of 270, excuse me, $175,000. They each split the cost to contract with TRPC to assist them in developing a climate mitigation plan. So those emission targets were to looking at 2015 as a base level where approximately 2.8 million metric tons of carbon dioxide was really that baseline for 2015. And something I really want to be clear about with this plan is we're looking at the emissions that are generated here within Thurston County. This is the energy we use to heat our homes. This is the fuel we use from chips that are generated here. This isn't accounting for consumer-based emissions. So if you go to Costco and buy blueberries in January that come from South America, we're not quantifying the emissions that are coming from those consumer-based um, demands. Yes? Is that because you're not able to? Or? Very difficult to be able to quantify, as, as well to an extent for local jurisdictions to have some impact on influencing and offsetting those. Thinking of the those. food system and the potential to reduce emissions. Right. Substituting local food for which, which highlights the importance of buying local. <laughs> Because, of course, buying local means that your food is produced locally, but it's also traveling less distance from farm to your table. Um, so those emissions targets were um, to achieve 45% 2015 levels by 2030, and then 85% 2000 levels by 2050. So th those are the targets that we're shooting for with the climate mitigation plan. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about um, how we intend to do that. But this is our community's part in, in trying um, to meet the Paris Agreement of um, preventing an increase um, of, of an average of two degrees Celsius um, industrial, prior to industrial levels by 2100. So this is just an overall um, picture of, of what the plan intends to do. Um, of course, we're going to do a fairly intensive public engagement strategy. We're going to assess actions, some that are already known, some that have been identified by TCAT, some that the local agencies have identified in, in their own plans, but also actions that are being proposed by community members, as well as actions being brought in by a consultant team that um, we've recruited to assist us on some of the technical analysis with this project. I'll talk a little bit more about the sort of the overall planning process and structure and who the players are in, in a following slide. But the idea here is to identify those key actions, leads, timeline, and cost, and an implementation strategy for each jurisdiction to be able to effectively implement not not only their own actions um, that they have some control over, but also agreement to some sort of countywide approaches to mitigation efforts. And so here on the bottom of the slide are just some examples, you know, um, building efficiency, reduce, reduction of energy, looking for other alternative clean sources of energy, um, working um, with the private sector to attract um, and bring in green jobs in our community whether that's manufacturing. And of course, continue to um, build upon our existing policies with promoting alternative transportation um, in the form of more compact land use, higher density development within our community, more use of transit, making our communities more walkable and pedestri more pedestrian friendly, more readily to access by getting around on bike, but also um, making sure that all new development supports electric vehicle charging infrastructure on site. So here are some of the players. So again, Thurston County, Lacey, Olympia, Tumwater are uh, the plan partners. And they have a steering committee that is composed of elected officials and staff that are really driving and steering the process. Um, and I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the the council members and leaders in our community. So from Thurston County, we have Commissioner Edwards and Menser um, who are uh, serving. 
From Olympia, we have Mayor Pro Tem Nathaniel Jones and Council Member Lisa Parshley. From Lacey, we have Council Members Cynthia Pratt and Carolyn Cox. And from Tumwater, we have Mayor Pete Komet. And the, the primary representative is Council Member Tom Oliva. And, and then on that steering committee, they've brought in their staff who help advise them at the steering committee. And then that interjurisdictional policy panel are those elected officials from the steering committee who are really working together and partnering to, to really help advocate for and, and push for an implementation strategy that they can all agree to. The steering committee has met twice. They have their third meeting, uh, Nathaniel. It's uh, April 24th at noon at TRPC. Um, those meetings are open to the public. Um, we do grant about 15 minutes opportunity at the end of each meeting for public comment. That's for anybody who's interested can show up. Those meetings are held at TRPC. And then we have a stakeholder advisory committee that consists of subject matter experts and other community representatives to kind of convene um, a, a broad group of representatives and bring diverse voices. They, they will really be advising the steering committee and looking at actions. And, and in another slide, I'll be showing you um, sort of where those subject matter experts are coming from because those are the areas um, from which we understand that the majority of our greenhouse gas emissions are coming from. And then we're in the process of, we're just, a, we're getting close to having a contract um, with a consultant team that we've charged with leading the public engagement strategy and performing the, the technical analysis and looking and evaluating the actions to see what, what um, impact they're going to have in meeting our emissions goals. And of course, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't say it didn't involve all of you, people like you and people throughout the community. So public engagement strategy is a large part of this. Um, this is fairly general, but I think this is the direction we're going in. We're looking at two public kickoff workshops to kind of provide some background information and explain what the planning process is about. Um, followed by two community open house meetings that will really be geared towards, here's the kind of actions that we've already thought of, what do you think of them, but also, um, what do you think? What do you think are the types of actions that, that we should be considering? The consultant team will then take all that feedback, roll it up, present it to the stakeholder committee. They'll identify some actions, but we'll also do one, perhaps two online surveys to really reach out broader to the community at large to get people's feedback on the direction we're going and the types of actions that we're looking at. The importance of using multimodal engagement tools. I, I think we're all pretty hooked on using social media, using websites, video, of course, email messaging. That'll be a big part of the strategy with, with engaging the community. And then we want to go out to where people are. So um, I, no promises yet, but you know, perhaps setting up an information booth at um, Lake Fair and Olympia in the summer, just so people who are walking by um, have the opportunity to, to learn about what we're doing and learn more about the process. So just one question on the time frame. So is plan Rev 1 already out, and all these meetings are going to be to talk about you know, what do you think of that? Or is it you're still working, having all these meetings to figure out what the plan Rev 1 is we, going to be? We have um, a, a schedule already outlined with, with a little bit of wiggle room because the consultant needs to come on board. But much of that public outreach that I'm talking about will be kicking off early summer and working through the fall for the first phase with, with um, those community workshops and the open houses. That survey, that first online, online survey, will likely be coming out around in November. Okay, thanks. Yep. So, Paul, I'm not, uh, I also hear in the question, um, uh, wondering about where the first list of actions will come from. Sorry if I missed that. And yeah. Is it is it coming? as a result of the public engagement process, or is it coming or is the public engagement process meant to review that first list of actions and respond and, and provide 
feedback on that. So, so um, TRPC, my, my colleague who no longer works at TRPC, Mike Burnham, has already done quite a bit of background work um, reviewing literature, looking at other communities' plans, and has identified some actions, and, and that's documented. TCAT has provided TRPC with a list of about 25 actions. We'll be going out to the community and saying, here's some of the actions we thought of. Um, and then the consultant team, of course, who's developed other climate action plans around the Pacific Northwest will share what they think are some ideas and best practices that are taking place in other communities, not here just in the Northwest, um, but across the state and the nation. That, that get to that? Yeah, that helps. Yeah. I was kind of hoping you had mentioned some of the standards we were talking about 2015 or something. And so I was thinking, oh, maybe we've had this thing since 2015 and I didn't know about it. And then I would have asked you, well, how the heck are we doing it? But uh, it sounds like it's just getting off the ground. Yeah. So um, some of the major tasks here is evaluating our missions inventory. And so early on I talked about sort of um, partnerships. So uh, TCAT has really been instrumental in not only advocating, but actually putting together an emissions inventory. And so they've worked with my agency um, to collect data on from, from our transportation research and our use of our transportation model to look at vehicle miles traveled as sort of a surrogate for transportation-based emissions, um, and also working through us to collect data from like Puget Sound Energy. So it's, it's been the good folks at TCAT that have done a lot of the number crunching and are keeping their eye on this and making sure that and advocating for local governments to be paying attention to these emissions inventory and, and using it as a tool to assess how we're going to achieve our goals. So one of the first steps is evaluating that emissions inventory. The consultants are gonna look at what we've identified for our baseline um, and, and making sure that that is fairly complete, that we're not missing any other data sources, that it's sort of following um, best uh, practices for evaluating emissions. And then as I, as I mentioned in response to Tom, what you pointed out and, and sir, your question on supplementing existing mitigation actions. So the areas that the stakeholder um, committee members are coming from in terms of subject matter expertise and the areas that we'll specifically be looking for actions in is one in buildings and energy, you know, energy efficiency in buildings um, specifically, transportation and land use. So um, if you think about, um, I talked about land use and density and of course the more people that can live in urban and city centers, they're making the most efficient shorter distance trips compared to neighbors that live in outlying rural areas making those longer distance trips. Agriculture and forestry practices, as well as water and waste, and by cross-cutting actions, those are just opportunities where we can pull in, let's say, higher education, um, organizations that are really effective with, with marketing and communication and pulling in partners like Timberland Regional Library. It's an opportunity to expand and bring in additional voices like, for example, students from Olympia High School to make sure that we're capturing youth voices in our process. Um, so performing qualitative and quantitative analysis, um, that's really where the consultants will be looking at um, in terms of this multi-criteria analysis what is the effectiveness and impact of, of this particular action on reducing greenhouse gas emissions? And um, it's, it's estimated cost and it's timeline to be able to do that. So what, what will this cost the community or a jurisdiction to implement these types of actions? Um, realization of co-benefits, and by co-benefits I'm referring to um, in terms of what does this action's uh, effect, does this have a positive effect on the economy overall, on public health, on things like equity? Um, feasibility, do local governments have the regulatory authority or, or the technical means to actually pull these types of actions off? And of course, urgency, you know, the, the timing of these actions. Um, is there certain opportunities say during when the legislature's in session to push through legislative opportunities for, for bills and new laws. 
Um, also the urgency of, of when we take action on particular um, strategies for reducing greenhouse gases. That will all be followed by scenario planning. It's kind of called as a wedge analysis. And what that does is it's, it's basically taking your baseline scenario of business as usual, that's how we're operating now, and, and applying sort of policy to that. So one example of a policy um, that we could be looking at is the corporate average fuel efficiency standards or CAFE standards. Um, what, what that policy impact will have on transportation-based emissions. Um, other legislative initiatives that the consultants um, will be evaluating and looking at. And, and it'll be kind of an iterative process. Each of those will be done sort of one toggle, one lever at a time to see what its net impact is on, on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And, and I don't want to claim to be an expert on that scenario planning, and that's why we've hired a consultant. So that's, that's my defense if you ask me any questions about it right now that I'm, I'm not going to be able to get too into detail on that one. Um, and then that last step, or not the last step, but next is defining and planning community actions. So that's like identifying who the leads are, um, what is the timeline, who the partners are and going to be implementing that, getting some community buy-in and helping establish what maybe some of those priority or values-based approaches to achieving some of our um, reductions. And then uh, probably one of the most important parts is developing implementation strategies. What is the timeline by which these are going to be done? Um, where might funding come from to do this? What types of agreements maybe should be, interlocal agreements might need to be established between the, the partners on the process? And also more important too is creating and monitoring a reporting framework. Um, so if we establish a missions inventory, how can we continue to maintain and put data and inputs into that inventory and track it. So having some sort of common platform that all four jurisdictions are working on um, to, to be using the same tool so that we know we're working in lockstep together. Okay, here I am, I'm at the end. So there's an opportunity for you to get involved. Um, TCAT has been very active in coming to our meetings. Tom is on our uh, stakeholder advisory committee representing TCAT. Um, you can go to our project website, trpc.org slash climate. That's just an alias, but that'll take you to the page where you can learn more about um, our climate and mitigation plans. And in that, that corner up there is um, that little red, that orange dot. You can click on that to sign up to receive email notifications from us on um, like when we're going to do workshops or open houses or when we're going to release the online survey, you, you can keep in touch with the project process on that. So yeah, any questions? Paul, on the implementation strategies, to what level of detail will phase two go and to what extent will some of the implementation planning be kicked into phase three? I understand there's a phase three also. Like, I, I'm not sure. I think phase three would actually be the implementation. Implementation. Yeah. So and continued monitoring and evaluation. Define the plan and raise the funding to implement the plan? Or phase two is the identification and prioritization of the actions with an implementation strategy, followed by adoption by the communities. I would think phase three, which we really haven't defined but I would think phase three would be continued um, monitoring and evaluation of our progress and revisiting in our, our plan at some time down the road to evaluate what's changed. What's changed in terms of funding opportunities? What's changed in terms of our understanding of climate change? And how might we need to respond and react to that and adjust as necessary? Yeah. I think you were first and then you. So the mitigation plan is following on the climate adaptation plan. What lessons did you learn from doing the adaptation plan that are useful in developing the mitigation plan? That's a great question. I'm going to have to think about that a little bit. But one, I think one thing that comes to mind is we're really good at developing plans. And by where I mean local governments. <clears throat> but then once the plans are done, 
they often have a tendency to sit on a shelf. And, 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 and I think that's where advocacy plays a role is um, community needs to be involved in local government. They need to come to council meetings. They need to understand what's in these plans and articulate to their elected officials. This is important. We need to do this. You adopted this plan. Why aren't you doing this? Look at your budget. Build this into your budget. Be thinking about this. That's just that's probably true in general of any plan. Um, but I'll have to think about what else you asked on that right now. It, there's For example, kind of drawing. on the adaptation plan, you also had a consultant do that, correct? No. That was all done in-house by Thurston Regional Planning Council. And that was a TRPC plan um, produced on behalf of, of all of our members. Um, you know, it, one thing I could say, too, is there's never enough funding to develop these plans. And we're on a really tight budget with this plan. And, and I guess the one thing I, I would say is maybe this is a baby step you know, for our community that we're not quite in the walk phase. And I think where we really need to get in our planning and, and where we're allocating funding to implementation, we need to get to that run phase. We're running with this. We're implementing these actions. And, and, and I know we've made progress with, um, after completing Sustainable Thurston and developing an adaptation plan, which, which is a really great plan. And I think we're going to have a really strong plan with, with climate mitigation. Um, but we need to continue to put more funding and resources into this, not just at the local level, but state and national level, too. So, Paul, could we I'm probably out of time here. The rest of the questions? So yep. Yeah. Sorry. Let's let Tom get up here. Yeah. That's OK. Well, um, while I've got a 30 seconds or so, um, i kind of building off of one of the questions about it's kind of what's next and the relationship with the the uh, adaptation plan, um, I think funding will be key. And one of the things that uh, TCAT has been pushing for is that a funding strategy be included in this climate mitigation plan so that there's a clear path for how we're going to get from where we are today to where we need to go. And I'll also be talking about early actions that we think can be started even before the climate, ad uh, climate mitigation plan is completed. This will be an 18-month process starting at the beginning of this year. So we're not going to see recommendations until like May or June of next year, right? And so we don't need to wait. And I know that uh, Nathaniel uh, with the Olympia City Council has asked their staff to look for these early actions so that they can incorporate it into their 2020 budget because those budgets get formed starting in, what, June or July of this year, right? Starting now. Starting now. Yeah. And, and that's pretty much the same with all the jurisdictions, uh, Lacey, uh, Lacey uh, Tumwater, and Thurston County. So let's get those early actions on the board right, right away so we can start getting those in the budgets and getting them on the policy agendas for 2020. Tom, I hope so, that works for you. All right, I'm sure it will. Thank you very much. I will compress buttons for you. Okay. So uh, what I'd like to talk about today is, and, and I'm not going to spend hardly any time on this because uh, Paul's done such an excellent job, but I would, I'll just refer to we do have local impacts of climate change we're already seeing here in our local communities. Then I'll talk about a little bit about local carbon emissions and targets. And then I want to really talk about uh, that, that list of early actions, local organizing, how we can really bring our community together around this topic and around this issue and around you know, the myriad of interconnections between climate change, housing, our economy, health, all the things that make our community valuable and make our our environment valuable to our community. So, how, you know, I want to talk a little bit about local organizing to really push this agenda forward and, and get it really to the top of, of uh, policy and funding agendas for our local uh, municipalities. <laughs> so, um, this is a picture in Thurston County, and I'd like your guesses about what this is a picture of. Where, where is this, and uh, who's, who might be affected in this picture? Looks forest. August 2018. Oh, smoke. Tell smoke. me more. Smoke. 
Fire. Okay. PM right. 2.5 at 250 to 300 plus. Yeah. In the red zone. Yeah. Every day. Okay. For how many days? All right. Yeah. How many days was it? 7, 12, yeah. 15, 14. Right. Could you repeat what he says? I could. Okay. He says, August 2018, smoke in our air. And where was that smoke coming from? Forest fires from BC, from several places too. I think Washington, BC, Oregon, Washington. California. Yeah. yeah, all over the place, all over the Pacific Northwest, basically. And PM 2.5, is that the right metric, Tom? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I don't remember the number, but it was high. Yeah, but, it was no, but that's interest. what they're measuring. It's the particulate matter at like microns. Yeah, PMI, I think, particulate matter index, something okay. like that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, <coughs> yeah, exactly. So this is actually Michael T. Simmons' school. So if those kids had been in class, you know, can you imagine? Or would they have been able to even go to class? What about the teachers that maybe were working early to try to you know, prepare their instructional material for the upcoming school year, right? So this is getting pretty close to home, and this is getting to you know, people and, and things we care a lot about. So, and, and Paul's already referred to the variety of local impacts that we will see increasingly, and they were already starting to see heat waves, forest fires. Uh, I didn't mention uh, specifically shellfish, but it is affecting our shellfish because CO2 is getting absorbed in the water, uh, increasing the acidity level. Um, floods, landslides, yeah. We had Oso here up in the northern part of the state. Anybody remember Caroline Beach back in 99? So those kinds of things we can expect to happen more frequently. And obviously sea level rise and the city of Olympia lot and the port are, are actively engaged in, in looking at that. So as uh, Paul also mentioned and as other speakers have mentioned, we can't continue with business as usual. That's not gonna get us where we need to be. And so why, why are we focused on the local level? Why don't we just go for the, you know, the big legislation at the national level or even at the state level? Well, uh, when the UN folks came together in 2015 in the Paris, you know, as part of the Paris uh, Conference and the Paris Accords that came out of that, one of the things that they realized, uh, aha moments for, for all these UN representatives from throughout the world, was that nation states are not gonna be able to solve this by themselves. It's really gonna take uh, significant engagement at the local municipal level, at the community level, and at exactly this level. So we, in fact, and, and I've seen other estimates that up to 60% of the changes that need to be made need to happen at the local level. And so we are the right people to do this, and we're at the right place at the right time. So it's up to us as a local community to really do our part to make this significant difference. Um, Paul mentioned the greenhouse gas inventory, and so this is just a sample of some of the data that, that we were able to come up with. Um, and uh, you can see the comparison between 2010 and 2016, and overall uh, we're down about 2% uh, and per resident down uh, uh, 6%. No, I'm sorry, we're up 2% overall, so gradually we're still increasing. Wrong direction we're going, you know. We're not increasing massively, but we need to pay attention to that. And, though, and even though we're down by 6% per resident, uh, because we're uh, increasing population, that's still not doing it for us, right? So we need to find smarter, better, bigger ways to bring our carbon emissions down. I got you, one. Can I get a chance in here? Okay, we'll, in the question and answer session, we'll, we'll welcome that. Thank you, Gary. Um, and so, um, and the, uh, the other thing that, and, and I think Paul referred to, is the main sources of uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, are built environment and transportation, on-road vehicle transportation. Built environment is like the buildings, heating and lighting the buildings that we're in. How come lighting is going up so much? I thought we had better lighting now. Yeah, so that's street lighting. So that's the, the lights that you, you see. And so I, I think that that, I mean, that's not a huge impact. That's only like... Uh, you know, in 2016, 6,000 metric tons as opposed to like almost 3 million metric tons overall. So it's pretty small, but it's the street lightings that basically the cities uh, install and maintain. And so I assume that maybe there was some new development or they installed a bunch of new street lights somewhere 
I, I, I don't know the details of that. So this is the carbon wedge, an example of the carbon wedge that Paul talked about. And so you can see that the business as usual line is that top black line. So if we did nothing, you know, this is where we would be uh, by 2050. We'd be way up there, way beyond what we need to achieve. Uh, the black dots represent what we need to achieve uh, and the targets, uh, Paul mentioned the targets, so they're targets basically for 2030 and for 2050. Uh, so the, those black dots, I think the second black dot is actually a 2035 target from an old, you know, a previous set of assumptions, but it just generally gives you the picture. Um, and uh, I think that black dot for 2030 would actually be 45% below, so it'd probably be somewhat lower than that. But we're still within a range we can achieve that uh, you know, with some strategies. But you can see that the major thing that we need to do in the orange block there in the middle is decarbonize the grid, which means we need to be working with the legislature. We need to be working with the Utilities and Transportation Commission. We need to be working with uh, PSC itself and their corporate decision making to make sure that they not only get off coal, but also get off natural gas and substitute coal and natural gas, substitute for coal and natural gas, real genuine clean energy sources of, uh, of power. So that's the major challenge. Uh, we also have building energy in there and we have transportation. Uh, and that's where a combination of electric vehicles and generally strategies that will reduce our vehicle miles traveled will be very important. I think it's also important to remember in the transportation area <clears throat> that is, as Paul indicated, uh, the, uh, the driver in, in the way we did uh, in, in the uh, standard, we're, we're using a standard protocol that's recommended by an international organization to come up with these numbers. And that, and the, the driver that we've, uh, we've chosen to, to uh, use for transportation is vehicle miles traveled combined with some assumptions about vehicle efficiency. And so uh, getting those vehicle miles traveled down uh, will be very important. And so even, even if we've got more people carpooling, if it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't overall bring our vehicle miles travel down, then we're still going to be stuck with some of these numbers not, not decreasing and not going in the right direction. So, no. Okay, so that's the carbon wedge. Uh, so we've established a couple, uh, about a year ago uh, at this conference, uh, at this convention actually, we established a campaign that we're calling Carbon Free Thurston. And as Paul indicated, it's that campaign that is really advocating for and um, organizing people around uh, calling on, on elected officials uh, to, 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 to follow through with this, uh, with this uh, greenhouse, uh, this uh, climate mitigation plan or climate action plan and uh, make sure it's a strong plan, it does the job, it, 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 it shows a path forward including financing, uh, including a schedule, and including strong commitments from each of the jurisdictions that they will in fact get this job done. Uh, because we've got, we don't have much time. Our latest uh, UN, uh, UN report tells us very clearly, we've got to start now, we've got 12 years basically to start turning this around. Uh, and this is not for the sake of, I mean, we care about uh, the environment, we care about glaciers in the Arctic, we care about polar bears, we care about, you know, uh, the, the, the crops that we grow here, uh, and we care about our people and our community. And so as I said in the opening session, you know, we care about our, our friends and neighbors here in Thurston County, and we care about our, our friends and relations all, all around the world. So that's what this is about. This is about our ability to, to, to have a functioning economy, a functioning society, uh, and it, it, I mean, I, uh, a couple of years ago, I told a, a buddy of mine at the Y, this is about uh, whether civilization will, will survive. And he kind of laughed, he couldn't believe that. Uh, but in fact, I think that's what this is about over, over the long term. And the decisions we make today are about, you know, what's going to happen seven generations down as, as Native peoples have, have been trying to teach us. So, uh, so we get comments out at city council meetings and county commissioner meetings. We're doing education and outreach. Uh, we have a sign-on document. I have copies of that over there that were, if you belong to an organization that you think, you know, would, would be receptive to caring about climate change and caring about these issues, then uh, see me afterwards and take a copy of that sign-on document 
and, and coordinate with us so that we can get that as your organization or community signs onto that, that we can get that forward to our elected officials, whether you're in Olympia, Lacey, Tumwater, or generally in Thurston County, so they know that there are not only individuals but groups of people out here that really care about this. So, so far we've had great success with labor. We've gotten two major labor endorsements for this sign-on document. We're working with faith leaders now. We're working with neighbor, and we're starting to work with neighborhood associations. Uh, Charlie back there has been doing some of that work with us with our Carbon Free Thurston campaign. And then uh, uh, Paul mentioned uh, early actions that we're calling for. So that list is also on the back table. And I, I invite you to take a look at that list. And that is not just, that's not, the comp that's not what we think is the comprehensive list of things that ought to be in doing in the climate mitigation plan. That's just the things that we think are fairly non-controversial that cities and the county could take on today and, and start to make some progress with, without a lot of analysis, right? I just make, and interject there. And the other thing, those earliest of actions, those are, those are in local government's plans. Those, those are actions that they recommended and identified. And, and so it's really just about encouraging and following through, following through with, with those actions. Right, right. Some of those are, yeah, yeah. And, and so it's, yeah, it's just asking them to, hey, you've already made this commitment. You've made the commitment to these targets. Why don't you, let's get started in doing some of this stuff. We can do this today, right? Thank you, Paul. Um, and so some of those early, act, the early actions are in four categories. So we've got an advocacy category, a community education and involvement category, infrastructure and energy, and a transportation category. And I'm going to skip over the rest of the detail around that because it's on the table back there. And uh, I'd be glad to talk with you afterwards um, because... Uh, well, I guess I've got a few minutes, but I don't want to. I want to yeah, allow. Some, lunch, so yeah, I, I got. I, I want to allow time for questions and so forth. So uh, advocacy, make it a priority on a legislative agenda. Um, get some training going in the community. Neighborhood grants. I think that would be a really cool idea. If if each city allocated maybe ten or twenty thousand dollars for neighborhood grants, so neighborhoods can come up with their own creative ideas, and and be uh, invited to demonstrate how this idea is going to significantly reduce uh, community greenhouse gas emissions, I think that could be a really cool incubator for getting people thinking about this and getting people involved. Um, Infrastructure and energy, we can do some things with local building codes. What if we incorporated, there's a number that federal government has been using over the past several years called the cost of, cost of carbon uh, that quantifies in terms of dollars uh, the, the, the cost of health impacts, the cost of, of additional energy uh, costs, uh, infrastructure development that result directly from uh, the use of greenhouse gases in our various activities and construction projects and roads and all this sort of thing. And so that can be a good guideline for making public decisions about what projects we're going to improve, what, uh, you know, what zoning kinds of things we're going to approve. If a developer has a proposal, ask them to include this cost of carbon figure in their proposal to demonstrate that it really is cost effective. So that would be a cost would come off of the top, and, and they'd have to demonstrate how they're going to minimize uh, the greenhouse gas emissions through this cost of carbon figure. Um, EV charging stations, commute trip reduction, and I was just in the uh, transportation session earlier, and this is a key strategy. Uh, how can we get more cars off the road, more people using other forms of transportation or carpooling or biking or whatever they need to do so that we can re reduce our, our, our uh, vehicle miles traveled. Uh, in addition to the Carbon Free Thurston uh, initiative, uh, we have a also a major coordination initiative. Barb has been leading that for us. Barb Scavese, who you heard from earlier, did such a great job organizing this convention. Uh, and we now have an online calendar that contains as many of the greenhouse or the um, climate change related events that we know of in Thurston County on, on a common calendar now, whether it's sponsored by the Sierra Club or sponsored by the local Audubon Society or PSE or whoever might be putting it on, we're, we're inviting them to put this on our, on our calendar. Um, 
We've got a coordinating council that meets every couple of months on the average that represents a variety of those organizations and comes together to talk about doing things in common, building strategies, moving forward so that we can be even more effective uh, by pulling people together. We've got an email, a weekly email newsletter. If you'd like to be on our newsletter list, I've got a sign-up sheet over there. Or if you have an interest in helping us in other ways, uh, you know, if you're, you're a great policy analyst, you've got experience in, in doing calculations, if you've got experience speaking before groups or writing articles or letters to the editor or any of that kind of stuff, uh, let us know and, and we'd be glad to get you involved. And then we also have a speakers bureau and uh, we're building toward an expertise database. So if you want a speaker, if your group is looking for a speaker on climate change as part of your presentation of the sign-on letter that we've got over there, uh, we've, we've got a list of speakers that are available. Uh, principal above uh, among those uh, is there's a strong climate reality group, and that's the group of uh, climate leaders who have been trained uh, with Al Gore's organization uh, to present solid information about climate change and what it means. So, uh, so that's, that's all on our, on our website and available to you. So, um, and then we also think that this, we could be a model here in Thurston County. We have, uh, we're relatively small, we're, we have an accessible, relatively accessible local government, including our elected officials who show up at conventions like that and are, you know, willing to, to talk to us and that's fantastic. Um, we have, a, I think, a very aware and engaged community overall, which is really good. Uh, we have uh, ability to track our results with, with the actions that we're taking and we, we've, we're kind of, we've got some good experience in how to do that. Um, and uh, we're generally at a manageable scale and, and scale of complexity that, that uh, you know, that this, this, involved, this is a very complex problem to figure out how to bring our greenhouse gas emissions down in a way that benefits the whole community. And so uh, we're, at, we're not at, you know, a 2 million or 10 million uh, resident scale so that we, we actually can get a hold of some of these things and work with the partners that can help us make these things happen. So in conclusion, we have data, we have targets set, we have planning that's started, uh, we have the right size community. So what we need now is early action. We need continued public pressure. We need to continue to show up at, at our city council meetings, our county commissioner meetings, and other forums that are gonna be part of this plan. And outside of those forums, we need to keep you know, acti activating and, and organizing and becoming more aware and getting, helping the community to become more aware of, of what the potential is here. And so that's where all of you come in to the picture here so that we can, we can provide that good community organization and provide that good uh, voice of the community as this plan goes forward. So uh, this is my final message. We need to change just about everything about how we do things. As I said earlier, no, biz, no more business as usual. Uh, and um, the other mantra that I try to keep in mind is that it's not about whether we're gonna do this. It's not even about when we're gonna do this. We know we have to do this now. It's about how we're gonna do it, right? And so that's the message that we're taking to elected officials and, and uh, that's what I'd like to ask you, I invite you to consider as a message that you wanna take to your friends and neighbors as well and to uh, other, as we go forward with this plan. So uh, you can volunteer, I've got sign-up sheets over there, or you can go to our website. And um, so now we've got a few minutes, I think, for questions. Yeah, so what uh, Thurston County is doing and the Climate Action Team are doing are fantastic, but there's one very big thing that's being totally overlooked when it comes to climate change, I think is equally as important and more powerful than focusing on reducing uh, fossil fuel emissions, that sort of thing. And there's one particular word that I haven't heard. Um, and what I'm talking about is a new paradigm. There's such a thing as looking in all the wrong places. What we uh, what we need to address is the fact that the ground is uh, actual and potential major sink, the major sink for carbon. And so what we need to be doing that can totally also transform agriculture is turning waste, organic matter, wood and so forth into charcoal. 
And the word that I'm talking about, the B word, is biochar. Uh -huh. it, it needs to be addressed uh, as a factor equally as important as trying to control <coughs> emissions. I personally think that it is a major way of reversing all of this, addressing nearly all the problems that have been mentioned, and reversing most of them with something that's very easy, ready to go, cheap, non-controversial. The only problem is it needs to get recommended and implemented. I agree with you. And um, I think you'll find uh, that discussed in the book Drawdown. Yep. That's one of the solution yep. sets there. Uh, and I think we have a workshop or two on, on, uh, on related on that topic. Uh, not specifically, I mean, it'll include biochar, yeah. but it's, it's, it's on the, the agriculture and land piece of things. Um, I, my, um, my take on this is let's get started with the things that are most easy for, uh, for local jurisdictions to take hold of. Uh, but I personally am hopeful that as we go down the road, we can start to put in place uh, some conversations and gather some data and get clearer about how we can make some of these sequestration things happen. Biochar, forestry, I think is important, uh, as, as well as the emissions. I mean, Paul referred to the fact that the, we're not including uh, sort of the um, supply chain emissions in this, right? Uh, so the, the, it's called scope three emissions. So um, uh, I think we, we need to start thinking ahead as, as we're doing this, as we're starting to make a difference on this, we need to be thinking toward the next step to, to include some of these other things. But with biochar, we can easily sequester carbon easily for a thousand years. Okay. It's easy to do. We can, go, we can start tomorrow. That's really good. Thank you, Gary. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a concern about the adaptation plan, and when we look at things from like potatoes in Ireland to quinoa in Argentina, like what we see is that like environmental catastrophe kills relatively few people when we factor in the like the, the political, social, economic side of things, where like we might have plenty of water here, but are we going to be out competed for water if we don't have municipal protections? over our right to the water that's here. Um, like I'm more worried about politically caused catastrophe as a, that stems from climate change than I am from the direct effects of climate change. I agree with you, the political catastrophes, and I, that's one of the reasons why uh, the United States military uh, has identified climate change as a a very important, if not the most serious uh, threat to our national security, in, in large part because of its impact on, and we're already seeing some of that in the Middle East, on, on, on civil unrest and military conflict and so forth. And they're one of the biggest do you, do you, uh, contributors to it also. What's that? They're one of the biggest contributors to it also. So, Paul, do you have? Yeah, I comments? would just say in adaptation that the issue of um, social unrest did come up. Um, it also came up in the context of climate migration, whereas here in the Pacific Northwest, the effects of climate change are going to be slower here than they will be further south and elsewhere in the U.S. And um, we're buffered sort of in, in large part by our, our marine climate. Um, however, we really struggled with how to deal with that, that some of those issues sort of did go beyond um, local policy and into national policy issues. We have tribal nations on our coast right now that are having to relocate their villages already because of climate change. <laughs> Olympia's um, sea level rise plan seems inadequate to me. Um, new buildings go up a little higher and, uh, I don't know, maybe put a wall around loft. But um, it, it just seems inadequate. Do you, do you agree that it's inadequate, or is there anything we can do about that? Um, I think there's some significant challenges to it. Um, I haven't. I, I can't claim that I've studied it carefully enough to to uh, um, to speak to it. But uh, I think it's a very difficult problem. And I don't. Uh, Nathaniel, would you have some thoughts on it? I guess what I would say is that the way the plan is laid out is that it's not uh, scaled in time but instead it's scaled in observed uh, sea level rise. 
And so it establishes various trigger points when actions need to be taken that, again, are not on a calendar, but rather on, are on uh, the actual events. The main thing that it does is it lays out the threats and the risks and shows where inundation will occur at what frequency. And then it calls for uh, governments to be working together, and it has a major piece on governance and financing those responses, which are the next steps that need to be taken. It, it does an 80-year look at uh, the kinds of uh, sea level rise that, that can be expected and goes up to 68 inches of identifying where those risks are. So I think it lays it out, but it doesn't give us uh, a, a, an implementable plan, if you will. It doesn't say you need to do this now and this later at some given date. Instead, it just says, here are the risks, this is how, how it will affect us, and we need to get our act together. That's the main thing that it does. The whole area so, is on a film. And most of downtown as well. Right. Yes. So one good earthquake and solve the whole problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I assume there's one point eventually when, when we just uh, evacuate the downtown? It, it acknowledges that retreat is one option, but it, it does not necessarily call that out. Um, it, the, the discussion between retreat versus protection is a major part of the plan. One more question, Paul. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. From. It's, Go ahead. It will be quick, but um, this is a question for you, Paul. Is, is it possible or is it too late for other cities in Thurston County to jump on board with this plan? And if it's not too late, do you think there's hope for other cities in Thurston County to join Olympia, Tomwater, and Lacey? This is our last That's question, and we'll be done. Uh, cool. Yep. Okay. Um, I, I would say it's, it's not too late in the context that they can participate and learn from our process. But the reason the four Lacey, Olympia, Tumwater, and the county came together is those were the jurisdictions that had actually the greatest source of emissions. Um, but because we have an interlocal agreement and those communities by resolution have adopted those targets, they're moving forward. But I, but I do think as time progresses, there will be opportunities for communities to learn from what we did with this plan and, and work towards their own or, or a larger regional effort at some point in the future. That also reminds me, Paul, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, TRPC at the direction of the steering committee has, is, is doing outreach to the local tribes, the three local tribes? Yeah, we, we did. Um, we're in the process of signing letters right now that are going to the Squawks and Chehalis and the Squally tribes to invite them. Um, as to however they see fit to participate in, in our plan development process. Okay, well, thank you all very much for joining us here. Uh, I guess it's this afternoon now. Thank you, Paul. And we'll see you at lunch. <laughs>